Welcome to an introduction to educational research, and this is video introduction part two. And the purpose of this video, number one, to discuss the distinction between a master's thesis and a master's field project. Number two, to share several examples of what a thesis looks like and what a field project might look like. Number three, to examine the role of an action research model and the role that that model might play in developing your thesis or field project. And as, as I mentioned in part one, if you have not already, it would be an excellent idea if prior to watching this video, you refer to pages three, four, and five in your master's thesis field project handbook. At the bottom of page three is a brief explanation of what constitutes a thesis, a field project, and then some other alternative projects that would also meet the requirements for your master's degree. As mentioned previously, page four consists of 12 steps recommended for completing your master's thesis or field project. And you can omit number three, since we're an online course, page five, contains everything you need to know concerning the content of your thesis or field project. Everything that should be included in your thesis or field project is listed on page five. Pages six, seven, eight, and nine walk you through step by step each section of your thesis or field project and gives you an explanation of what should be involved and what should be in there. And then finally, on pages 10 and 11, you have the rubric that will be used to evaluate your thesis or field project when you have completed your master's degree work. Again, as I've mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to get a really good understanding, since you're just starting out, of what is going to be required of you and what your expectations are. It'll save you a great deal of time later on. All right, well, let's take a look at then the thesis and field project. Now, simply put, a thesis is a scientific study. It uses a systematic set of scientific procedures to examine a problem or answer a question. And you can see on your screen some examples of titles of what a thesis might look like. First one is the use of constant time delay strategy to teach single digit multiplication facts. Well, constant time delay is a, um, an educational strategy and it's a very simple study that can be done in the classroom, very easily done. Example two, the effects of positive reinforcement on in-seat behavior of a student with autism. Again, <clears throat> a very simple scientific study that can be done in the classroom. Number three is a survey research, a survey of teacher attitudes toward project-based learning activities. And the last example there is sort of a correlational study, a re the relationship between student participation in extracurricular activities and attendance. All of these are examples of titles of what a thesis would be, a scientific study. And let me show you some um, well, no, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of what, the, um, what it might look like. Let's assume you're a special education, special day class teacher in a first or second grade classroom. And you have a student who constantly calls out during class and frequently engages in disruptive talking that's disturbing the class and interrupting the lesson. And you decide you'd like to reduce the number of student disruptive behaviors. Well, okay, you've taken the first step. You've identified a problem, reducing some in inappropriate behavior, in this case, calling out. So you use the university databases, and you begin to read up on behavior reduction strategies, let's say. And you become interested in one of several what are referred to as differential reinforcement strategies which is called differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. Now, that's a fancy sounding name, 
but basically this strategy consists of reinforcing the student when they're engaging in behavior that is incompatible with the target behavior, which is calling out. In other words, you'd reinforce non-calling out behaviors and withhold reinforcement when the student is engaged in calling out behaviors. All right, so you decide to examine the effectiveness of this strategy, this differential reinforcement strategy with this particular student. If it proves successful, it will help this student to remain on task and it might become an additional part of your behavior management toolbox. So to start with, for the first five days, you have your classroom aid collect baseline data during the first period on the frequency or number of times that the student calls out. After five days, the results were, let's take a look. The first day, the student called out 10 times. The second day, 12 times. The third day, 11 times. The fourth day, 11 times. And the fifth day, 12 times. So the data would look like you see on the screen right now if you were graphing it. You see that the number of callouts is fairly stable. So you have 10 and 12, 11, 11, and 12. That's a total of 56 callouts during those five days, which the mean would be 11.2, but you could round that to 11. So 11 callouts, the average, 11 callouts per day. Since this data is fairly stable, you make an assumption that the behavior has reached its natural level in the environment and that if there is no intervention, if you don't do a thing, if you take no action, the number of callouts is going to remain about the same every day. So now you decide to take some action. So for the next week, you introduce this differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior strategy. So when the student is not engaged in calling out behaviors and is engaged in appropriate classroom behaviors, you make eye contact with the student, you smile, you verbally reinforce the student, excellent job, and so on. And if the student is engaged in, appropriate, in, in inappropriate classroom behavior, you ignore the student or you withhold reinforcement. Your classroom aide continues to track the frequency of the callouts for each class and the data looks like what you see on your screen now. At the end of the week, the data is as follows. There was 11 callouts, then 5, then 4, then 7, then 4. So there was a total of 31 callouts, and that averages out to around 6 callouts per class session. Well, since the data has moved in a therapeutic direction, callouts went down, it appears that the differential reinforcement of the incompatible behavior strategies is working. But to make sure, you decide to go back to the baseline condition and you withdraw the reinforcement strategy. And for the next week, you have your aid collect data again. And the data looks like appears on your screen now. The re results were seven callouts, then 12, then 10, then 12, and then 11, for a total of 52 and a rounded average of 10 callouts. So the data moved in a contra therapeutic direction. It went back up. It was headed in the wrong direction. So finally, you decide to go back to the intervention condition. And you have your aid collect data again, and you get the results that look like this. You get a total, you have 10, and then 8, and 6, and 4, and 4, and 5, for a total of 37 callouts, which averages basically to about 6 callouts per day. So the data has moved in a therapeutic direction. You review what has taken place. You took baseline data and your student was calling out on an average of about 11 times per class period. You introduced the intervention, the differential reinforcement, and the callouts went down to six times per class session. You withdrew the intervention, and the data went back up again to about 10 times. And finally, you reintroduced the intervention, and the data went back down to six times per class session. 
you conclude that the differential reinforcement intervention was very successful because student callouts decreased when the differential reinforcement was in place and increased when it was withdrawn. At your next department meeting, you share your results with your team for their review. Well, you have just completed a thesis, a scientific study. You identified a problem. You searched the literature for some behavior reduction strategies to deal with the problem and decided that the differential reinforcement sounded good to you. You developed the plan. You implemented the plan. You collected your data and analyzed the data. And then you reported your results to your peers. This would be an excellent thesis. This would be an A+, plus, an A+. Plus. Very, very simply done, very easy to do, no statistics, just a visual representation of data on a graph. That's all that's to it. Well, that is an example of a thesis. Let's take a look at some of the thesis that students have done. Here is a thesis. The effects of social story strategies on social skills of high school students with intellectual disabilities. By the way, this is a poster that the students that you will produce at the end when you have completed everything for your master's degree, you will produce a poster like this also. Very simple. The university will give you a template to do it. It's very easily done. But notice the different sections. There's an introduction section. There's a methodology section a results section. And here the uh, student gave an example of what the social stories were, the conclusions, the literature cited, and acknowledgments. That's an example of a student thesis. Another example, the effects of digital tools on developing literacy skills in middle school students and their impact on acquiring language arts common core standards. Again, this is a scientific study. Again, notice the different parts of it. Introduction, methodology, results, conclusions. Let's take a look at another one. An assessment of community attitudes and behavior to inclusion of youth with disabilities in youth sports and recreational activities. Now, this was a piece of survey research. This was a thesis, and again, you can see the parts the introduction, materials and methods, survey questions, results, conclusions. And our final example, can students differentiate their own instruction? Again, another example of a very simple study done in a classroom. Well, those are four examples of what a thesis looks like. Let's take a look at a field project. Now, a field project produces a product to address or solve an educational problem, a dilemma, or a need. The project consists of objectives that are clearly spelled out, and the means for evaluation of the objectives are clearly spelled out also. Now, some examples of what students have done Websites were created that shared information, special information on a topic. In-service training modules students have developed. Uh, also, parent training awareness modules. Computer software was developed to address educational problems. A project can be almost anything other than the traditional scientific study. Let's take a look at some examples of student projects. Here's an example of a project, building awareness of a connection between good nutrition and student success, a workshop for preschool families. So this student developed a workshop as a project. Another example, transformative teacher leadership. Again, another example of sort of an in-service training that was developed. Bring your own device, policy making and implementation. This particular student introduced the idea of bringing your own device to school and uh, help the school get financial support and uh, parent involvement. Strategies for successful transition to college for students with Asperger's syndrome. 
and this was a guidebook that was created for parents and teachers of college-bound high school students with Asperger's. Now, those are all examples of field projects. Model that can be used to either develop your thesis or develop a field project. It's a systematic inquiry conducted by teachers, action researchers, administrators, counselors, etc., to improve their own specific educational practice in their classrooms, their schools, or their district. It's a cyclical model. You identify an area of focus, you collect data, you analyze, and then you develop a plan. The model looks somewhat like this. You can see the identification of a problem, and part of that process is you limit the area of your inquiry. You, you just pick an area of inquiry, then you limit it down. You review the related literature. Then you develop a plan. Who and what will you study? Why will you study that? How will you study it? Your methodology? Will it be quantitative research design, qualitative? And that'll all be explained to you. You collect data. Then you analyze your data, form conclusions. You report your results and you adjust or you begin to examine a new area. And that's the action research model. Well, okay, so that is it for the distinction between a thesis, which is a scientific study, can be done in the classroom, very easily done, a field project, or an action research model used to develop your thesis or field project. So this is the end of the introductory video part two. We'll see you in part three. Thank you.